Hello, I'm Baba Elefante, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching the number one site for learning bass online for BassPlayersOnly.com, where I've taken all the frustration out of learning bass so you could build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy playing music. It's not for everyone. It's for BassPlayersOnly.com. We have a very special guest this week. We've never actually met in person, but we've known of each other for a long time. This is kind of a uh, uh, late incoming interview, if that's the right way to phrase that. I should have done it earlier is what I meant to say. Baba Elefante. He's recorded for TV, movies, records. He's performed with Roy Hargrove, Pete Christlieb, Justo Almario, Brandon Fields. I used to see those guys in the LA clubs like 30 years ago. Uh, welcome, Baba. So great to have you. Welcome to ForBassPlayersOnly.com. I am honored to be here. Thank you very much for doing the interview. Let's start from the beginning. How would you describe your musical upbringing? Come from a musical family, parents into you know, records playing, brothers and sisters into yeah, music. Yeah, uh, my uh, I, I started playing at twelve. My my older brother was a guitar player, so I was into sports, and you know my dad was actually a professional boxer. Really? So, so we grew up with with four ounce gloves. <laughs> so if, you mis room, you know? if you misbehaved or got out of line, uh, he'd, uh, oh, he'd he took care you. of it. But uh, but uh, yeah, so. But I was really into sports, and my brother was playing music, and, and, and my cousins played music, uh, who are Dino and John Elefante. My cousin John was with the group Kansas for a little while. Right. And, right. Yeah, and then, uh, so anyway, so we had a family band, and, and they needed a bass player. That's how I started. You know, I played saxophone, a little guitar, keyboards, and then I ended up in bass and, and loved it. You did? Because okay. Yeah. Uh, what? Well... Who were your influences on the bass once you discovered the instrument or once it was foisted upon you? When I first started playing, I, I was listening to a lot of uh, um, funk. It was a great, because it was, I started playing in 68. So it was like, you know, in 70s, it was the greatest era in the world for, for bass players. Absolutely. You know, everything was bass driven. Yeah. So I, funk in the, in the band, we were playing popular rock and dance tunes, you know, everything from the Beatles, Beach Boys, Earth, Wind and Fire. So obviously, you know, like Verity and White at the time, uh, James Jamerson, uh, people I would listen to that were on the radio. Um, and I remember I was, uh, I think, 15 years old and and I thought I was the best bass player in the world. I was, I was teaching kids on the block, just like songs I knew, you know. Anything I heard on the radio, I pretty much can play. And then someone brought over a Stanley Clark record. Uh, it, was, it was a Chick Corea record uh, um, with Stanley Clark. And I go, oh my gosh, that's the bass? So I had to reevaluate everything. I almost quit playing until I heard something, somebody really play the instrument, you know. And then I, then I went out and, and, and uh, to the record store, records at the time, shows my age. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and looked for every solo bass record I could find, uh, you know, and I came across cross at that point you know uh myra Slav, who played with weather report and, yep. and obviously jocko you know a mind blower and and uh um alfonso johnson and that's probably what would uh uh sort of got me to study then instead of just playing in, in dance bands studying more jazz and, and uh you know i always loved jazz my mom was, was a was a huge jazz fan and she had the 78s the live at the philharmonic Oh. And I, I, I would jazz, listen to jazz at the Philharmonic. Jazz, yeah, 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 jazz. At the Phil and jazz. I heard Ray Brown. I go, who's that? What is that? You know, I didn't know what he was doing, but it just sounded cool to me. You know, and so later on, I, I sort of studied that in, in, in the harmony and you know of jazz, and became you know deeply involved with that. Yeah, you're primarily known as a fretless player yeah. to me, anyway. So how how did that come about? I was playing in in, in dance bands at the time and listening to jo Jocko Pastorius probably influenced me the most on that. And I remember going on the road and all I brought was a fretless bass because I wanted to learn it and I was terrible. It was, you know, the first couple of days they were looking at me, I couldn't play it in tune and, and it was, it was, you know, swim or, you know, or, or drown. And so right. after, at the end of the week, I was starting to get the hang of it a little more and, you know, and then I just kind of fell in love with the expression of that instrument. Took you a whole week to learn to play fretless. Huh? <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I'm still learning. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, I, I think I saw some other names like Alain Caron. Did I see his name in some of the stuff? I, I'm well, I used to teach. I used to teach at the LA Base uh, Center. Right. And so it, uh, it was really cool. Like you know, it was a what? A, have you been? Were you? Did you ever go there when it was uh, happening? Yeah. Was that on Ventura? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I I've, I've been there. I I lived in Studio City for a while. Okay. Long time. So yeah, right on Ventura Boulevard there, and it was it was uh, um, the first teachers there were Jeff. Uh, I mean, Steve Bailey, Jeff Berlin, um, Trevor, Dan Glenn, Dan. Uh, and, and myself. And then, then people who would teach there were, were like Carol Kay would, was there for a while. Wow. Uh, Francis Rocco Prestia would show everybody what is hip. <laughs> yeah. And, but it was so, it's such a cool hand because any given day, Chuck Rainey would walk in and whole court and Willie Weeks. And it was just a great place for bass players, yeah. So anyway, and Elaine Caron came in, and I hooked up with him for a lesson, and, and uh, that was really very, very cool. Gary Willis, you know, would walk in, and I'd just grab, you know, like like an hour with him, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's royalty, bass royalty. You just oh, I'm telling you, it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. a great hang. Phil Chen came in all the time. He would, Phil Chen was a good friend of mine, as a matter of fact, yeah. So what's keeping you? Oh, uh, let's not forget about the upright. Tell me about your experience there. Yeah, so you know, being involved in jazz and stuff, I was playing a club uh, with a, a group I played with, the Ron Kobayashi Trio. Trio, right, right. Ron Kobayashi, Steve Dixon, great players, and we were doing this club two nights a week. And I thought I'm going to just bring upright in for one of the nights, and I did it for five years, you know, and to get my chops together on that. Unfortunately, I haven't been playing too much upright. I got in a bike accident. Uh, right when the pandemic started and, and I separated my shoulder, broke six ribs. And when I'm playing upright, it, it just, it bothers me a little bit. You know, it, it, I get tired quick with, with that. So I've been, haven't been playing as much as I, you know, practicing as much as I'd like to, I should say. Tell me what's keeping you busy these days. Um, I just recorded, we, we, the Ron Kobayashi Trio just recorded a, a CD actually during the pandemic. And uh, that, is, is mixed and ready to go just you know the last minute stuff and a cd whatever that means these days it, it it's going to be online it's and it'll be up for streaming you know but it's it's a really cool uh cd well i keep saying cd which will probably have some tangible copies but um it has a uh, doug the great doug webb is on it this is a oh, great yeah. sax player yeah and uh i met him we, many years ago i think at the baked potato probably yeah he played there a lot in, and hung there. Was, yeah, I think he was playing with Brian Bromberg at the time. I think that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, and uh, oh, we have a tap dancer on there. We're doing a Thelonious Monk tune with a tap dancer. Wow. Yeah. So Sam Katz. Yeah. Sam Katz. I did a gig with Gregory Hines once. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. Speaking of tap dancing. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, you know, then I'm teaching. I'm teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, uh, adjunct, and Orange County School of Arts. You know, really talented kids there. Um, so between that and private lessons, I, I stay pretty busy. Yeah. All right. Well, that segues beautifully into what I wanted to ask you next, which is about teaching and learning bass. Uh, it's a little bit because you're, you're primarily teaching the younger people. It sounds like in the, in the schools, the colleges, right? Yeah. And, some and adults, that. some adults. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. mo most of the people that that are attracted to for bassplayersonly.com to to come and learn to play bass are mostly men in their 50s, 60s, 70s. I, I got a text wow. the other day, an email from uh, somebody who says, I'm, I'm going to be 76 uh, like in a couple of months. He's been with me for years. He loves that's it. awesome. Yeah, that's too and cool. The reason I say that is just to, to give you a little context that they probably have a different mindset than the, the kids in the, I call them kids, the kids in the colleges. Uh, these guys aren't, aren't trying to make careers out of it. They just want to get together with their friends, play some classic rock riffs, some blues shuffles, right. maybe the walking bass line. And, and uh, you know, a, a lot of them have, uh, I don't know, sore muscles, creaky bones. They're, they're getting older, maybe arthritis, things like that. That's when you mentioned your, your uh, shoulder troubles and yeah. your, your ribs. And the, so when, in that context, what advice do you have for, for somebody who wants to learn bass, somebody like that? What do you think is important? When I get older students, it's usually people who, who want to try something new. Or, or they want to, uh, they, they're, they're, they're actually playing out, but they didn't get, they started with A and missed B, C, went right to, you know, H. <laughs> they're playing gigs. 
So they didn't learn what they, they just emulated. And so those those kind of players, I, I kind of start with the basics of chord tones and kind of show them what they're already doing. Explain to them, you know, this is what you're doing with that riff. This is what it means to the scale or the, or the key you're in, you know. Um, and it's interesting because I, I, I also, about nine years ago, I started a jazz workshop, okay, for all instruments. And I get some old people in there and... and uh, it's not really lessons. It's a workshop where I'll say I'll pick a tune uh, and, and I'll have and someone's a total beginner, but just wants to have fun. I start them out with j just look at the chord changes to say a tune like take the A train. Just hit C hold, and count to four. Hit it again. Count to four. Go to D. And then then sooner or later, then I'll say, OK, now play C. We'll do like a two fill. Then hit the third. Here's the third. Learn the third major minor thirds. So they're actually playing, you know, jazz at a. At a, at a level, at their own level, basically, you know, and it, it's fun for them because they can, they're hearing the rest of the band play and they're, they're making music. And that's really the important thing. Right. I mean, if you play the root, that's 25% of our job right there. That's right? It. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So, so you're saying you're, you're showing them what they're already doing because they're doing it, but they don't really know what they're doing. So you're showing them like under the hood. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I've actually taught some, some professional players on, with, on tour with some named people and they would do a bass solo and they go, I know this riff works and this riff works. Why do they work? <laughs> and I'll say, well, what you're playing already, you're playing in the key of G or E minor. And, you know, and I explain to them the, 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 um, the theory behind it. And, and, and I, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, no matter what level, if you go from the ground up and, and, and show basics, basics are so important. Uh, it gives you something to build off of. And, you know, I think every player... I won't really show anybody songs right away. I'll show them songs later on, but I want them to understand what they're doing. So, you know, we'll start out with a major scale and then say, okay, here's, here's chord tones, you know, here's seventh chords. Maybe some of the more advanced students, I, I would do chord extensions. But basically, you know, if a player understands chord tones, every possible rate, walking line, bass riff, funk line uses chord tones, you know, and it's, you, you can get a lot of mileage out of that. Yeah, you mentioned Ray Brown earlier. I remember going through the, that classic book. He, the book is called Volume One, but he never did a Volume Two. He just <laughs> right. one. But uh, what what you're talking about reminds me of he did, okay, play the scale now, play it uh, in in thirds, play it in fourths, play it in fifths. Yes, in sixths. That's really bizarre to, to think of. That. Uh, <laughs> well, you know the thing about that too is is I, I do that a lot as well, and I really make the point that you're practicing, you're not performing separate those two you're, you're doing that not to you'll never play this on a gig <laughs> but this is going to get your hands thinking about what those intervals are and you know but if they i, I got to constantly say i don't care if it sounds good you're separating the music from practicing is like doing push-ups you know i mean if you're a football player you don't practice running touchdowns you do all the other stuff that gets you the agility to, to, to get there you know yeah, yeah. Good point. What about the folks that have, you know, as we get older, things are, you know, the old body's not quite what it used to be. <laughs> uh, how do you, how do you deal with that in with your older students or, you know, some of my younger students, I've got a guy very talented, but he, he broke his hand a while ago, uh, yeah. uh, uh, rollerblading. Oh, and wow. Someone else had a hip replacement. Somebody else had, uh, 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 what uh, Parkinson's and you know, all kinds yeah. of, I, I run the gamut and uh, I, I, that is a lot. It's not everybody, but that uh, it's arthritis, tendonitis, those kinds of things. So any thoughts or insights as to how to help those people play the bass? Advil and ice. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, uh, but I, I think that uh, that's a really good point. You know, like when, as you get older, I, I really do try to, if I get a younger student, to show them proper technique, you know, not bending their wrists and relaxing, you know, trying to, trying, trying to get into almost a meditative mode. You know, when you're practicing, don't get all tense and, you know, rigor mortis sets in. You know, if you're trying something new, keep telling yourself to relax. Older students, um, you know, there's not much you could do except, like, show them more comfortable ways to play it and, I, and reinforce the fact that, look, you're not going to, you don't have to have, you know, like uh, Victor Wooten chops. You know, you you could you could play songs and, and enjoy music, playing some simple things, 
Right. And that's really what it's all about, you know, is uh, uh, simple is, is actually one of the best things on bass, too. With, with the era of YouTube, we think everybody has to do calisthenics, you know. Right. You won't work if you do that all the time. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I, I have uh, my, my, it's called Groove Grower, my Groove Grower framework, which is a theme and variations setup. So it starts out very simple. And each variation is just a little bit more complicated than the one before it. And right. the backing tracks work for all the variations. So you oh, can move at your own pace. And that's what I tell my students. It, 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 like, like you just said, to your point, in most cases, not just in music, but in just about anything, simple is usually better, usually works better. So you know, it, it gives them a chance to, to get in there and you're actually making music, even getting yes. back to your take the A train example. And you're just playing the, the roots and then maybe the, the third, the fifth. And, you know, you're. you're yes. Doing it. Yeah. Tell me tell me about your uh, your base, your bases, your gear. I see a couple of bases over your shoulder. Yeah, I have I, my main base is the F base. Uh, ah, a Lane Crowan model for Canada. Yeah, exactly. The for Lanettos. Yeah, the Fernaletto. Yeah, Marcel George. Marcel and George. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I also have a um, another fretless F bass, a uh, passive. This is active. And I have a Sire bass for fretted. Oh, okay. I own a Federa, which is a great, you know, wonderful instrument. And uh, you know, what I teach on is is, is a, like a $250 jazz bass squire. Okay. Vintage modified, which sounds great. What kind of strings do you play? GHS, I, I'm endorsed with them. But uh, Super Steels. Ah, Super steels, yeah, and they're uh, yeah. And I, 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 on my on my fretless, I have regular uh, uh, super steels, and on the B string, I have a contact core just because it feels tighter. Mm -hmm. The B string, yeah. Uh, what about amps and stuff? Amps, um, amps I primarily use Epiphany. Ah, okay. Uh, and I have you know various speakers. I have I mainly use a, a three ten um, and a Epiphany Piccolo head. I have another uh, you know, 502 head or 501, something like that. And then I have various Epiphany speakers, the ultra light, because I'm getting up in, in the age here. <laughs> so I, I love light equipment. They, they're making amps so great now compared to the old days. What would you be if you were not a bass player, something outside <laughs> of music? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, uh, th this is another thing I, I'll tell you. I've only had outside of music two jobs that were regular job. I, I was a busboy at 14 and I think for a brief period I delivered papers. That's it. I've always made my living as a musician and I knew I wanted to do that at 12 years old, you know, so if I, if I, I actually boxed till I was about 16, 17 and I thought about going in, into that actually and, and uh, music was a little easier <laughs> in some respects. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I, it's, you know, I love teaching. I'd probably be a teacher somehow. I, I really uh, am fond of teaching. I, I found that through music, you know, and, and I love sharing with, with students uh, ideas and things I've been through. Well, that's great. That's so great catching up with you, Baba. After all this time, after all I know. these years, we finally, <laughs> we finally got Baba. Hey. <laughs> I love what you do. I love the fretless stuff. I love uh, all the other stuff that you do. And I'm uh, really glad to have you in the For Bass Players Only community. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. All yeah. right. Keep it up and let us know what's happening. You got Thank it. you to our special guest, Baba Elefante. I'm John Liebman. You are watching the number one site for learning bass online for bassplayersonly.com, where I've taken all the frustration out of learning bass so you can build confidence, have fun, and just enjoy making music. Remember, it's not for everyone. It's for bass players only. Dot com. Thanks again to Baba Elefante. I'm John Liebman. I'll see you all next week. Let's play bass.